Hi. Uh, thank you for, for having me. I uh, just flew in from uh, Denver last night. Well, I think it was like four hours ago. <laughs> uh, I had about three hours of sleep. I'm not completely responsible for what I say today. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a good time to be here. Your Broncos are doing really well, and our Broncos are doing really well. So we started our seasons quite good. Um, what's that? It's your Vandals. <laughs> For somebody out of state, that's a very interesting thing to introduce. Uh, our Vandals um, hopefully are not doing well. Um, <laughs> You have, you have interesting culture here. Um, so I, I, I thank you for having me. I, I, I want to speak a bit about the future. If we could bring my slides up, that would be good. Or I'll bring my slides up, because you gave me this. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I am a little conflicted uh, today. I'm, I'm here to talk about the future and, and strategy, and um, it is September 11th. And... That was already mentioned. We had a moment of silence, but I'm not sure if you're aware, but it was, it was actually this very hour, this very moment that I'm speaking that the North Tower fell and thousands of people lost their lives in a cloud of dust and ash. And then over the next few days, our stock market took a similar path and billions of dollars were lost in a... a um, cloud of dust and ash, and then we were thrust into a very confusing um, and difficult war um, that changed travel and life for billions of people, probably forever. Yet, we endure. And in America, we more than endured. We, we've thrived since then. We've had our ups. We've had our downs. Um, but it's interesting to me that humanity, when given uh, some basic supports and a bit of margin to innovate, can overcome just about anything. And that idea of what enables innovation, the margin that creates that space to create, and that, that's one of the most important things, that the creation of space to create is actually more important often than the creation itself. And that's really the job of education. It's the job of employers to be able to do that. And we're going to talk about that today. The, the world is changing at a remarkably astonishing rate. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. This age of agility is um, something that is new for most people. We are going to look at the, there we go. We're, I, I, I work for, uh, I work with, I uh, am the CEO of a software company that measures um, behaviors and mindsets. And in my past, I've worked in software companies as a strategist for, for the corporations and for products. And, and I've always looked through, especially now as I run a company that, that does behavioral measurement, I look at the data about the future through the lens of behaviors, the lens of the human perspective. And I don't believe we can stop with just the data itself. The science that we use, which will... We'll, I'll talk about throughout the, uh, my, our time today. The science that we use was created about 60 years ago. And my business partner, a clinical psychologist, uh, about 20 years ago, started to um, measure the qualities of uh, what made people successful in different types of jobs for large corporations like Cox Enterprises, organizations like the US Army and Air Force. And uh, we've automated the process that he used to use to be able to identify those qualities that make people successful. You can call them soft skills, 21st century skills, uh, essential skills. Uh, we measure about 102 of those skills. Well, actually, actually 102. It's not, not about 102. And, and it's very, very interesting as we start to collect this data, and we've, we've got billions and billions of data points, um, being able to cut this data and look at different types of 
uh, patterns is very interesting. The um, National Institutes of Health with uh, the uh, Health and Human Services uh, used our science to measure uh, in their own accelerator inside of HHS the qualities of their most innovative people and how their innovation and creativity was changed over time as being a part of their innovation accelerator. I was very excited about this because um, being able to find out how to make people in federal government more creative and innovative is something I think we would all like to sign up for. Uh, and the state of Colorado, it, we partnered with about a year and a half ago, and it's a project that's still ongoing, to, uh, and they invited hundreds of employers to measure, uh, survey their top performers in the 20 hardest to fill jobs in the state of Colorado to identify those, the intensity levels of certain behaviors that are patterns across those. So that that information could then inform our workforce and our educational institutions to know how to develop people to be successful. Uh, there are very clear patterns in what makes people successful. Um, the uh, Forum for Youth Investment uh, talked about us, so it, we're using curriculum and, and all these different uh, pieces. But the, the important thing is that we have been able to identify um, certain patterns and certain types of jobs, and to be able to look at the data for the future through the lens of human behavior, we can predict in many ways the way that certain fiscal conditions will impact mindsets and how those mindsets will then impact behaviors. And then we can deduce logically how those types of behaviors will then impact fiscal conditions again. And that is, is really, really important right now as things are accelerating so, so fast. When we think about this word agile, what, what comes to mind? Flexibility? In business, how do we think about it? Adaptability. Adaptability. In your processes, in your thinking. A lot of times when you talk to people, they think about a quick mind, right? So we have to stay on top of things. Now, I've worked in organizations that had really quick minds. But what's really interesting to me is that a lot of those organizations had a very innovative team or teams, and they isolated their innovation, but the business itself never moved. The innovation was localized. I see the same thing in education. Um, last night, the reason why I'm late is because of Colorado Succeeds. Um, I was uh, a judge for the Succeeds Prize for educators. It's kind of the Oscars for teachers who are very, very innovative. And we had these uh, different groups of teachers come and present and show us their creative ideas. And I started to ask questions about how much support do you have in your organization. One teacher actually said, when they said, I, I created this website to share with other teachers around the state and the, and the world how I learned coding to be able to teach that to my elementary school kids. And somebody in the audience said, one of the judges said, so how many people are on your website? Well. The district won't let me release it because I have to have a certificate. And like, are we teaching kids what the internet is about, which is the sharing of ideas? And this is someone who taught themselves, but didn't do it officially. I was, I was, I was saddened by this. Um, being agile. And having innovation within your organization without moving it, the root word of agile is agilis, which comes from a gear, which is to drive us. So innovation without movement is like, in a business, it's like staring at your very unique and innovative navel, right? You're, you're not really doing anything at all. Now, I know quite a bit about this because I worked at a company. You see that little logo way up there on the right and that N? It used to be the only one on that building. 
There are a whole bunch of other companies in that building now because that organization, Novell, is tiny. It was the fifth largest software company in the world. In 1999, I was running uh, marketing and strategy for the directory services division. Uh, our CEO at the time was Eric Schmidt, right before he went to run Google. We had a product called GroupWise. It was the most amazing email program. Internally, we called it Gmail. <laughs> I had a Timex watch that would receive, 1999, I had a Timex watch that would receive my email from my Gmail. 1999. I had an ID card that when I went into my building and it was, set, it was between a certain amount of hours in the morning, by the time I got to my desk, my schedule for the day was printing out on my printer because it knew I had arrived and it knew that's what I wanted. 1999. You ever see any of that stuff? We got to play with it. But the problem was that, that business never shifted. Eric Schmidt had a team in Silicon Valley that was incredibly creative. He had a lot of creative people in, in um, uh, uh, Provo and Orem, Utah, where I was. But he couldn't actually get the company to move. And that company now is pretty much almost non-existent. The only thing that's remaining is actually one of my products, which is called Zenworks, Zero Effort Networks. There's a lot of other companies. I actually did a study. I did a bunch of kind of futurist stuff when I was there. On uh, Really, I, I did a study in 1999 about AOL, and that they had the opportunity to become this juggernaut of identity management where your identity would be able to follow you everywhere regardless of your machine. Then Google built that in AOL. Listen, my brother still has an AOL account. Um, he's a boomer, but uh, I'm, I'm a Gen Xer, so uh, we created the internet, and I have to take credit for that somehow. Um, <laughs> now, why is all this important? Why is all this important? The world is changing at an exponentially rapid rate, and the ripple effects of this will change everything about how you hire and the global, uh, even here in Boise and around the world. Producing more than you actually need as an individual is a relatively new phenomenon. This is real GDP from since the beginning of life, and look at the growth that has happened there. Now, this is, this is actually quite staggering. It, the reason why this is important is because where does innovation happen? Innovation happens when you have margin. You cannot innovate when you're running for your life. You can think of Maslow's hierarchy or whatever you want, but innovation happens with margin, and prosperity creates margin. And as prosperity increases and margin increases, change happens. Now, if you look at some evidence of this, this is uh, just a, uh, a, where people voted for the most innovative um, discoveries and, uh, and, and creations in time. And it's really, really interesting. In the beginning of time, with all these innovations, it was for the elite. So the Greeks and the Romans, Thales and, and even Gutenberg was the son of an aristocrat, created the printing press. But then in the United States, something remarkable happened. A shift occurred where innovation and creation moved from the elite to the average person. But guess what? It only happened after there was a little bit of margin. Thomas Edison worked for Wells Fargo. You know when he started to do his innovations? When he took the late shift. I mean, not Wells Fargo, um, uh, Western Union. And so he was telegraph operator. And he said, can I have the late shift? And he started to work at night so he could invent while he was at work. 
He probably wasn't a very good employee, but he was a really good inventor. <laughs> now, you think about um, Henry Ford. Henry Ford, son of immigrants, he became an engineer with the Edison Illuminating Company. It actually says, if you go to Wikipedia, this is, I'm not a genius or anything, I just read Wikipedia like everybody else. Um, after he was promoted to chief engineer in 1893, he had enough time and money to devote attention to his personal experiments on gasoline engines. I'd like to thank the Edison Illuminating Company for getting us all here today. Wilbur Wright, very normal, healthy teen. Then he was in a hockey game, knocked his two front teeth out, got depressed, dropped out of school, stayed at home, and read in his father's library. I'd like to thank a very mean hockey player for my ability to fly here today. Because it was an unfortunate margin, but it was a margin nonetheless. That he was able to think, and he was able to create. So innovators require margin to think to iterate and really continually renew their optimism. It's interesting, when we survey startup CEOs, we find that startup CEOs of successful companies are in the upper 92 to 100 percentile of optimism. It's a very measurable, measurable quality. And their innovation and creativity is actually very high. So on the flip side, too much prosperity leads to complacency. So there's this kind of sweet spot for most people where there has to be a risk-taking innovator and they have to have enough space. Now, how does this affect us now? It's kind of interesting that this is the world living in absolute poverty. Now, the number for absolute poverty is still really, really, really low. But it's dropped from 44% to 9.6% in just the last few decades. Now, with this, you can still see in 1988, there were enormous, there were billions of people still living in abject poverty. But there were almost no measurable percentage of population in developed countries like the United States. So think about where innovation was coming. We're the innovation leaders of the world, right? We created the internet. We created all these wonderful things. What's happened in the last 23 years? Staggering shift in the drop of poverty and prosperity is increasing around the world. Now, what is happening because of this? This scares me, not because Opportunity is creating around the world, but America's taking their foot off the gas. If you look at these charts, this is from Crunchbase. The chart on the left is the number of investment deals in angel, seed, early stage companies. The quantity of deals. Worldwide is the bars in blue, which are going up, 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 up. America had about 67% about 70% of those deals in 2012, and we dropped to right around 50% in only five years worldwide. The chart on the right is the actual money invested. America went down. It was the year of an election. Investment goes down a little bit. But our position of having over two-thirds of the dollars invested in innovation in innovative companies is now half in five years. So as prosperity increases, there's margin to think. We do not have a corner on the market of innovation because creativity and innovation is not an ethnic advantage for anybody. In our measurements around the world, our survey's in, in six languages right now, it's been validated in 23, Creativity, innovation, curiosity, imagination, entrepreneurialism exists in equal measure in all demographics and all ethnic groups. So our position is changing. What's interesting is that we've also noticed, as innovation is increasing around the world, that 
in American youth, in teenagers, we've seen a decline in creativity and innovation. So, as innovation increases, things like this, automation increases. Jobs are becoming more skilled. This is, I don't know if everybody heard of auto, that drove Budweiser uh, from, we had to pick beer, of all things. The, the first automated truck delivery in the United States was from Denver to Colorado Springs, um, a truck full of Budweiser beer. No one touched the wheel of this. Somebody was in there. Thank God, somebody was in there. But it went without a hitch. A truck driver is the number one job in 24 states in the United States. It is the number two job in, what, 19 others, I believe. Um, think about that for a second. So how many people have a direct relative living in Idaho? All right. How many people have a direct relative that's a cybersecurity professional? One, two, three, four, five. All right, it's interesting. Do you know how many open cybersecurity jobs there are in the United States? As of 20 minutes ago, it's 301,876. There are actually 50,000 open truck driver jobs in the United States. We don't even have enough truck drivers, but what's happening is we're now recruiting from every type of industry into other industries because of our global prosperity. There are 768,096 people currently employed. So there's, there's about a 45% openings that we can't fill in cybersecurity jobs right now. If all the cybersecurity professionals and all the jobs were filled and they all lived in Idaho, your population would increase 65%. It would be a really interesting change, wouldn't it? Quite a geeky change. Um, there are actually more cybersecurity professionals employed than in, in Boise, and every city and town in Idaho named after a falls or an animal, pretty much. Um, which is a lot. Actually, if you look at your cities, my gosh. So, so now we've got a different crisis. You know, if, if, if you look at all the different jobs, there are actually more workers than jobs for low-skilled jobs, right? There are particular industries for high-skilled jobs, like doctors and others, that, you know, we have gaps. But as a whole, there are actually more workers. In the middle-skilled jobs, there's a 19% gap. Now, this, these make up... over 48% of all openings in the United States, and there's just not enough people. Do you think this is going to get better or worse? It's going to get a whole lot worse because guess what? Innovation is increasing. You know, it's interesting that as innovation is increasing, everyone's freaked out, oh, we're going to lose our jobs, right? Well, they're creating new jobs, but they're creating different jobs, and they're more higher skilled. What we're going to have to do as an education system to deal with this is instead of teaching people what they need to know, we're going to have to teach them how to learn. Instead of teaching people what to think, we're going to have to teach them how to think. I love it when the shift that we're seeing where people are moving even from project-based learning to problem-based learning because the world that they're facing is going to look completely different than it does in middle school by the time they get out of high school. Now, what's interesting is that this situation has occurred before, but it's never occurred in the history of the United States across all industries unless we were in a direct war. Never in our history. So in the 1980s, think about 1985, the world of the personal computer, what were they teaching in our colleges and universities? Fortran and COBOL. Who, who was actually doing hiring for uh, people with PCs, uh, PC experience back in the 80s? I was one of those people. You, you, you would have to be older than me for that, but which is probably hard right now. 
employers couldn't find people, right? So what did they do? They started to train their own people internally, get certificates from HP, Compaq, Novell, and, and others. But people without experience, without college degrees, were getting jobs. They were stacking certificates because they understood the technology. And employers were desperate. So they hired them without a college degree. They had to broaden their view of talent. Now we find that exact same situation across virtually every industry because you know what's common across every industry? Technology. There hasn't been a commonality across every single industry before. There was more specificity. So the skills that are transferable, the soft skills and certain hard skills, are going to work. Now, give people the ability to work. Now, we had a, a bit of a solution for this with international workers. There's some interesting statistics. Um, did you realize that greater than 70% of all full-time graduate students in electrical engineering are foreign-born in the United States? 63.2% in computer science, not raised up in our schools. 60.4% in industrial engineering, and more than 50% in chemical, materials, mechanical engineering, as well as economics, all foreign-born. There are seven major universities with greater than 90% foreign students in their engineering programs. In computer science, there are eight universities, major universities, that have over 90% foreign. Why are our students not getting into these schools. Now, I don't, I don't have a problem at all with, I'm a big fan, H-1B visas. Uh, I, I, used, I loved that we were training um, all these brilliant people from around the world because I would hire them. But now, guess what? There's global prosperity. They're going back home. We can't even poach the foreign students, the foreign nationals, that we're training anymore. So that part of our talent pipeline is even going away. And boy, they are innovative. 47% of every startup in Silicon Valley in the last seven years had a foreign-born founder. And now they're going home, a lot of them. But we can still poach. This is the actual homepage for a website from a bunch of Colorado companies that are not shy about it. <laughs> Come on, you don't like Silicon Valley anyway. You got eight people living in a one-room apartment. Buy your own house. That worked last year. This year, it's not so easy. Um, you can only have four people in that house now. Um, but yeah, this, this is a, a bunch of companies that are now actively poaching from other areas. But this is the first step. They're poaching people in their own industry that are already trained. What's happening next, as you increase your work-based learning, is you're going to poach others. Now, this is a big, this made huge headlines. 13 companies that no longer require employees to have a college degree. Well, they're almost all tech companies. And my answer to that is, duh, it was a stupid idea in the first place. But this is the first step. They're broadening their view of talent. They're looking elsewhere for that talent. And they're upskilling their own staff. So this is a, a McKinsey study that said that 29% uh, of all companies in the US and Europe say that skilling up their staff is the number one, or, top, or actually 79%. Um, only 22% said it is not a top priority. I wonder about those companies that 22% say it's not a top priority to train our staff. I, I would like to visit them again in five years and see if they're still around. Um, but this is a huge shift that is happening um, in companies, and that's how they're responding to it. It's not enough. You can't just keep up skilling your own people because you've got to bring more people in. And so we have... Organizations like CareerWise, we have work-based learning programs. This is a program, you probably have heard of it, many of you, that is 
uh, an apprenticeship model, three-year apprenticeship model in, for high school students modeled after the Swiss model. It's been going on for a couple decades now. That's wildly successful. There are hundreds of employers that have signed up to this. There are students who are suddenly doing well in school uh, because they finally connect learning to actual work. Um, this is one of many different types of uh, steps that employers are taking, but I don't think it's enough. Each one of these are small stopgap motion moment. Uh, they're not going to address the bigger problem. One of the problems is that now as I start to look for talent in different places, how do I vet them? How do my managers know how to interview people? Right? When they don't fit that mold of what I want. And how do you make your organization more competitive and innovative when you're just trying to put people in seats? The, the, the sense is that you have to compromise. We talk to people all the time and they go, I want more top, uh, I want to increase my diversity. And they think they're going to have to settle for B players to be able to do that, which to me is horribly insulting. The key, I believe, is diversity. The thing that will create America or s secure a position as the innovative leader is diversity. But what do you think of when I say diversity? Diversity in a company. What, what comes to mind? What's that? Ethnic, Ethnic diversity. Let's make our company more colorful. Different viewpoints. Thank you for that. That's usually not in the top few. Thought and ideas. For sure. You know the, the origin of this? I mean, we're having a little English class today. Um, the origin of diversity is to divert. It's not to become more colorful. It's to change your direction, to change your path. So somebody very dear to me, a woman, brilliant, was invited to be on a, an international board of directors for a nonprofit. The chairman said, she said, why, why, why do you want me on this board of directors? He said, well, I have a goal before the end of the year to have our, our board 50% female. I don't want to be too crass here, but she thought to herself, so I have girl parts. That qualifies me here. Now, his heart was good. Later in the conversation, more things were brought up about her ability to think and perspective and that type. But why is that what we think about in diversity? People are going to smell that. If, if your intention is not to change by the people that you bring in, to hire people for what they bring rather than what they are, you will never become diverse because people will smell it. That person has not formally answered, it's been months, because she's thinking, yeah, I'm not really sure if they want me for me. Imagine how that's affecting your hiring. Now, this is an organization that is struggling with this right now. Please have a seat. I'll be honest. Your resume is not what I'm used to. I know. Okay, so what would you bring to my company? What do you need? I need a hard worker. Good. I've got two part-time jobs and to help my parents pay the bills. I need problem-solving skills. I got through high school without a car, a phone, or a computer. No college degree, though. Not yet, but life's taught me a lot, and I'm ready for more. Well, you're not the typical kind of candidate that I hire. But you are exactly what I'm looking for. your company could be missing out on the candidates it needs most. Learn how to find, cultivate, and train a great pool of untapped talent at gradsoflife.org. 
No, I'm not a pitch man for Grads of Life. I just love the organization, and I love that video, and I think it's incredibly powerful and profound. And I wonder, did this woman believe that she deserved that job because she was a black female? I don't think so. What would get her into the interview? What would get her there? What's required? She has to believe she can do it. Where does that come from? It comes from some part with people that told her she can. I, understanding what is required to succeed in that job, it requires the belief of an employer of what truly is necessary. Something really interesting happened in there. He was looking at what he wanted, and she asked him, what do you need? It's very interesting in the hiring process, this is where it all goes sideways. An employer goes to the recruiters, he goes, I gotta hire somebody. What do you want? I want a four-year degree. I want somebody like this, 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 because that's what they think they have. But what's, what's interesting is it's not necessarily what they have. I'm gonna jump aside here. This is an example of what somebody thought they had versus what they really had. So this is a, this is an, a profile from our system for a text-based call center company, international company. They said, we can't get enough candidates for a text-based call center. They always quit. And, and I looked at them and I said, how many candidates do you get? There's like thousands and thousands of candidates all over the place. And I'm like, I, I, I beg to differ. Let's survey the people in your organization to see what makes them successful. And what we found is that these text-based call center people, you know, the ones that you know, are texting six people simultaneously, these little bars, uh, gold bars are the intensity levels. And how similar they are is the, of the top performers is the size of the, if it's really small, they're very similar. So vitality, that's just how much you want out of life. Way over here is squeezing the very marrow out of life. Over there is, yeah, life, I don't really care. Text-based call center people don't want much out of life. <laughs> Supportiveness, they're not really emotionally supportive. Have you ever experienced that in text-based call center? <laughs> this must be really hard for you. Have you ever heard that? My wife wants me to say that a lot. I think I could be a text-based call center person. They're not very sociable. They don't even like themselves that much as far as self-regard. Um, they don't manage themselves very well, but guess what? They're really, really alike in their inability to manage themselves. <laughs> Um, creativity and imagination, not so much. But guess what? They're really high in conflict management. They don't mind it. Commonality, they can think like other people so they don't retranslate in their own head what you say. The ones that are good at this hear it and understand it. And they follow rules and they're relatively rational. They were getting plenty of applicants, they just didn't like them. So they never made it through the interview. What do I need versus what do I want? I want someone that I want to hang out with at the office. What I have is something different than that. I want something different than what I have, which means I don't know what I need. So part of this is changing your own culture as well. This is an organization that decided to launch their new culture and their new values. And there was lots of excitement. It's a little grainy, but you kind of get the idea. <laughs> I hid the names to protect the guilty. Um, but part of this is starting at the top. It's moving to understanding what you really need. Now, I'm talking a lot about diversity. I'm a middle-aged white guy that runs a software company. What do you think about my life? Where did I go to school? What kind of family did I grow up in? I think Stanford MBA, middle-class environment. Not exactly. My family went through multiple bankruptcies. My father had PTSD. There was physical, sexual abuse, addiction in my family. 
My mother remarried to a practicing bisexual. I had three different ethnicities in my family. I dropped out of community college after two months because I got tired of raising my parents. That was when I wasn't doing drugs. Six years after that, went on the road with a band. This guy had no future until educators and businesses said, I see more in you. And I got a certificate. And that certificate changed my life. And it led to another, and led to another, and led to another. And I eventually worked directly for this guy. I think that may actually be my speech I wrote for him before he went to run Google. Work-based learning works. It changes the course of people's lives. But it requires belief. It requires belief from the individual that there is an opportunity that they can follow. It requires businesses and programs to accommodate that belief because they have to believe it first. In my company, I started this company with, with a mission to make education relevant and hiring equitable. I believe it's the same problem. And we've adjusted our values for that. If you look at our values, I love the last one. It's like go chase down joy, bring it back and share it with everybody else is what that means. But it's really about valuing the whole person and growing. And I believe that that's something that every single company and every educational institution would benefit from. So I ask you, as employers, uh, everybody is an employer in some way, and as educators, discover what you have, not really what you want, and then start asking for what you need. Influence the education system in a way that is tangible enough where they can adjust. Become a maker of talent and not just a taker. Create your own margin for innovation within your staff. And I believe, if we all believed in human potential and not the color of people's skin or not exactly what's on their resume, that we will be able to have the most diverse and the most creative and innovative nation in the world for a long time to come. Because the other, the other countries that are now moving into innovation, they're not moving more diverse, are they? It'll be a long time before they get to that part. We have an opportunity in the United States right now to look at diversity differently, of what people bring that can divert us, that can change our thinking, rather than what they are. So I hope you join me in that, and thanks for the opportunity.